Good morning and welcome to this short act of worship for the fourth Sunday after Trinity. We begin with the collect for today. Let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not our hold on things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is taken from the prophecy of Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 to 12. Zechariah, chapter 9, Verses 9 to 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your King comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war-horse from Jerusalem, and the battle-bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit, Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 145, verses 8 to 15. Psalm 145 verses 8 to 15. The response to the psalm. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. The Lord is gracious and merciful, long-suffering and of great goodness. The Lord is loving to everyone and his mercy is over all his creatures. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised. All your works praise you, O Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom, and speak of your mighty power. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised. To make known to all peoples your mighty acts, and the glorious splendour of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised. The Lord is sure in all his words, and faithful in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all those who fall, and lifts up all those who are bowed down. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised. The New Testament reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 7, verses 15 to 25a. Romans 7, verses 15 to 25a. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. 
For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. And it's Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 19 and then verses 25 to 30. So Matthew 11, verses 16 to 19, and then verses 25 to 30. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You often find that when it comes to the great British weather, there's no pleasing some folk. When it's hot and sunny, people straight away head down to the beach, most notably Bournemouth of late. But if the heat wave continues on for too long, we soon get folk complaining about it and wanting it to rain. And when the rain and the winds and lower temperatures do come, you get those who then express a longing for the sun and heat to return. When it comes to the good old British weather, it seems that as a nation 
we can't quite make up our minds as to what we really, really want. And rather more seriously, the same can be said about the reaction of people to Jesus and to John the Baptist, his forerunner. As our Lord points out, they were both being rejected for quite opposite reasons. In the case of John the Baptist, they complained because they wanted a happy and unchallenging message. But instead, what they got from John was a message which spoke of sin and the need to repent, to turn back to God. John's teaching was too uncomfortable, too challenging for them. What's more, they weren't impressed by John's simple lifestyle either, eating no bread and drinking no wine. But when it came to Jesus, it seems that what the people were expecting was a solemn discussion on religion and morals. But what Jesus actually brought was a message of salvation, a message of good news for sinners. Indeed, he ate and drank in the company of those labelled at the time as sinners in order to bring them back to God. There was really no pleasing the people, it would seem. But, says the Lord, those who are truly wise will see the messages, the wisdom of the messages of both John the Baptist and Jesus, taking heed of both John's call to repentance and the message of forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. The wise won't simply go along with those who can't make up their minds about what they really, really want. The thing is, is that the reality of the good news of the kingdom of God always upsets our preconceptions. It's always new, unexpected and challenging. It doesn't simply go along with our own ideas and preferences and expectations. Because the gospel takes sin and our need to repent very seriously, whilst at the same time taking very seriously the reality of God's love and mercy extended to all who come to him in penitence and faith. It's so often tempting to want to pick out those aspects of the Christian message which we find more acceptable to us, more palatable, as it were, and sideline those aspects which are rather more challenging, rather more difficult to accept. It might even be tempting to water down some of the more demanding elements of the message in order to make it somehow more attractive to our contemporary society. But the reality is that we can't simply pick and choose what bits of the message of Christ we prefer and which fit in nicely with our own preconceptions and ideas about God. Rather, we must accept and hold fast to the message in its entirety, as revealed to us in the scriptures, with all its demands and challenges. Indeed, far from reinforcing our own desires and ways of thinking, the true word of God is actually unsettling. In a sense, it ought to, ought to make us feel uncomfortable. If a Christian preacher only ever tell you, tells you what you want to hear, then they're failing in their responsibilities. And the Lord goes on to call sinners to come to him, all who are weary and weighed down by sin. Now, ordinary Jewish folk at the time would no doubt have found religion to be something of a burden rather than a joy. The religious leaders had turned it into a religion based on endless regulations and duties which would have been somewhat wearisome to the people. 
This wasn't about the Old Testament law itself, but rather the multitude of rules and interpretations of the law which the religious leaders added to it, which they made people follow meticulously. By contrast, Jesus comes to lift the burden off people's shoulders and to give us rest, not in a literal sense, but rest in terms of peace and fulfilment, a sense of being put right with God. And the Lord goes even further by inviting us to take his yoke upon us and to enter into partnership with him. Now the yoke was a wooden collar which ran across the shoulders of a pair of oxen, allowing them together to pull huge weights. It was often used metaphorically to describe obedience to the law. So what Jesus is saying here to those who are weighed down by all the burdensome rules and regulations which the religious leaders placed upon them was that they shouldn't be weighed down at all. The yoke should not be oppressive. Jesus' yoke is easy, not because it makes light demands, far from it, but because it involves entering into, into a relationship with the one who is gentle and humble in heart. Set free from sin through the cross of Christ, we are able to fulfil the real requirements of God's law, at the heart of which is love. In our reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, the Apostle speaking in very personal terms, but at the same time reflecting the experience of all human beings, talks of the way in which we want to do what is right in God's sight, but because of sin, we're constantly being drawn away from this. It's as if there are two conflicting desires within us. When I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand, he says. So who then can save us from this situation? Well, it is Christ alone. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And finally, in our Gospel reading, Matthew also records a snippet from our Lord's prayer life, in which he gives thanks to his Father for those who do accept him and his message. Ironically, the religious leaders at the time, who were meant to be very wise and learned in theological matters, were actually the ones who failed to accept Jesus. They failed to recognise the one who ultimately fulfils the prophecy of Zechariah in our Old Testament reading, that of God's coming ruler, who comes not as a warrior or military leader, but in peace the one who through his death and resurrection is triumphant over sin and death and has inaugurated a new and everlasting covenant which brings real and lasting peace to people from any nation who turn to him in faith. The one who now reigns over all. Rather, it was the people whom the world regarded as insignificant, people who, by worldly standards, would not have been regarded as great intellectuals. Just consider the Twelve Apostles, for instance. These are the folk who were truly open to the light of Christ and became his disciples. In the end, true godly wisdom is not about how many letters you have after your name, or how many years you've spent in theological college, or how many lectures you've, you've had to sit through at university. Spiritual understanding does, does not depend on how academic we might be or think ourselves to be, but rather it is the gift of God imparted to those who truly seek him in faith. 
the Swiss theologian Karl Barth, probably the greatest of the 20th, 20th century theologians, was once asked by some students if he could summarise his whole life's work in theology in a sentence. They were obviously waiting for the great man to come out with some profound theological insight. But instead he simply answered, Yes, I can. In the words of a song I learned at my mother's knee, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. For Bart, it was in this simple understanding and not in the endless academic volumes he wrote where the real wisdom of God was to be found. That's not to say, of course, that there isn't some, indeed, much great value in much theological learning and research. I'm certainly not advocating an anti-intellectual approach to faith. But academic learning has its limits. The thing is, we can amass a great deal of knowledge about God and theology. But this is no substitute for actually knowing God personally in our lives. This, after all, is the essence of Christianity. It's only when we're in that relationship with the Father through his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and when we experience the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we can gain true godly wisdom. And it's in the context of this relationship that we then need to dig deeper, taking time to read and study God's word. May we be those who are truly wise, accepting the real life-changing message, message of the gospel in all its fullness, and in turn allowing ourselves to be transformed by it. So this morning, Christ invites us to come to him to receive forgiveness of our sins and to be restored to a right relationship with our Heavenly Father. We only need to come, entrust ourselves to him and we will find rest for our souls. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that through your Son you have called us to be your people. Help us always to seek your wisdom and to accept the message of your word in all its fullness. In Jesus' name. Amen. And we conclude with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.